G'day and welcome back to the vlog, the rant, whatever you want to call it. Oh, it's so hot today, it's summer here. On the weekend, it was freezing. Um, I had my jeans on and a jacket and so did most of the other people out here. There was supposed to be a model jet meeting here, a three day model jet meeting, and it was cooled off because of the rain and the wind and the cold. And the people who did turn up and sat under the, in their gazebos watching the rainfall, they were all dressed up in jackets and you know shivering away too. So it was like midwinter. And now, three days later, it's like a sauna. We've got, it's like, I don't know, it's about 28 degrees in, in American money. That's 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite hot for this part of the world. And it's 173.9% humidity. I wouldn't lie to you. That's honest truth. Yeah, <laughs> but it's really humid. It's so humid. And we've got damn flies everywhere. And the problem with flies, I don't know if you've noticed this yourself, but I've been spraying with the fly spray. And once the, apparently once the temperature reaches a certain level, fly spray doesn't kill flies anymore. It gives them a bit of a headache, but they metabolize the, the um, insecticides faster than the insecticides can kill them. So it just knocks them around a bit, doesn't actually kill them. And you notice, I've noticed this at home, you know, you give a place a bit of a blast with a fly spray and the flies all collect on the windowsill. And before you get a chance to vacuum them up, they've come back to life and flying around again in the hot weather. It's, what do you do? Um, yeah, so anyone who can come up with a bit of fly spray is going to make a lot of money, certainly around these parts. Anyway, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I just talked about the weather, because everyone likes to talk about the weather. There's never a shortage of weather. There's always some weather, and this year has been absolutely unbelievable here. We've had winds, and we've had, we had the, the problem is we've had like a week and a half of really high temperatures. And so people are saying, oh, it's been a great summer, because there was a week and a half of high temperatures. We've had winds, we've had rain. It's like, oh, and now we've got another two weeks of rain and strong winds. We've got ex-tropical cyclones coming down. It's like, what? And here I am trying to do flight tests and things for my other channel. It's just like, forget it. It's just no way. And of course, this, um, this time of the year, we've got drag racing and things at the airfield. So flying opportunity. In the summer, I like to do flight tests and things. This summer, I've had very little opportunity. It's really annoying me. Um, so there'll probably be a big burst on my RC Model Reviews channel. As soon as we get a couple of fine days, I'll be spending all my time flying and reviewing airframes. Anyway, enough of that. On to the vlog, the rant that you have come to love and cherish so much. Uh, first of all, a good news. I had an email from someone in Iceland. Yes, Iceland. Have you heard of it? It's way up north. Um, probably quite cold there right now, I would think. Um, and they said, have a look at our drone rules. So I put on my thickest coat, jersey, vest, um, overcoat, and my snowshoes, jumped on the interwebs and surfed across the icy plains to Iceland, to their website of the Iceland aviation people and read the rules for Iceland. And I was quite reasonably impressed, to be honest. To date, I've thought that CASA in Australia has been one of the best regulators. Okay, they, technically you can't fly FPV there, but that's the same in quite a few countries actually, if you really read the rules quite literally. Uh, but CAS has been a pretty good balance so far between rights and responsibilities. Now Iceland is getting right up there. Let me just paraphrase some of the rules for you because it, it's always good to know the rules in other countries because you might visit them, but also because it gives you some kind of indication as to how well your own regulator is handling that very difficult balance between rights and responsibilities. So Iceland, Let's look at the rules for you. Right, first of all, airports, airfields. The, this is a major problem with a lot. No, no, Canada really got hammered by this. They had, what, nine kilometer radius around an airport. Any airport, anywhere an aircraft could take off or land. And it basically made the whole country a no-fly zone for a while until they repealed those interim regulations and come up with something different, which is a little bit, but not a hell of a lot better. But in Iceland, they have decided that you cannot fly within two kilometers of an international airport or one that has regularly scheduled flights. So that's a big, fairly big airport. Okay, that's fine. Um, that's good. Two kilometres. Great. That's a good balance between, you know, safety and the rights of people to fly their toys. And they have put an extra thing in there. Though. Like in New Zealand, you can fly as close as you like to an airport so long as you fly below the level of the tallest nearby structure. That's a really good thing too because if you're flying in a park, you know, a few hundred, say half a kilometre from an airport, and you're staying below the trees, you're simply not going to have an incident. You're not going to hit an aircraft because I've yet to see Cessna 172s and 747s weaving their way through the trees in the local park. So that's great. That's, yeah, New Zealand came up with that shielded operation thing, I think. And it's really good to see other countries picking it up. Our CAA has done some really good things. They've done some crap things, but it's the one thing they've done that is really quite good. In New Zealand, we have to stay four kilometers away from airports. And the silly thing is that it doesn't matter whether it's our largest international airport with flights every 30 seconds coming from all directions, or whether it is a tiny tin pot little listed airfield in the middle of nowhere like the airfield that 
I operate from, where we might be lucky to get one flight a day, and it's usually just a little 172 or a microlite. The same rule applies to both, which shows that someone isn't doing the risk profiling properly in CAA. In Iceland, it's two kilometres from international and airfields with scheduled services, and one and a half kilometres from other airfields. So that's pretty damn good. That doesn't close the place off too much to model and drone flying. Excellent, Iceland, well done. You get bonus points for that. Now, um, you lose points, however, because just like Canada, you've got to put your name, address, and phone number on your model. Why? Why? The thing that annoys me is that the anti-drone lobby are always telling us, ooh, these drones, they jeopardize our privacy, they invade our privacy, where our privacy is sacrosanct. Yet it seems that if you have a drone or a model aircraft, you don't have any privacy. Why? Why do I have to tell everybody exactly who I am and where I live just because I choose to fly a model aircraft or a drone? No. All you need is your phone number and maybe your name. You don't need your address. What value? If someone's got your name and or your phone number, they can get a hold of you. Certainly if it's someone in authority, if it's the police or the regulator, they know how to track you down, right? They don't need to have your address listed on thing. And it's like, it'd be interesting to see if you had a drone and say you, you lost it or something, and five years later someone finds it and it's got your old address on it and they take it to the police. Will the police prosecute you for having a false address on your drone? It's little things like that. Ridiculous, lunacy, silly things. Um, but then again, I don't countenance having a registration scheme where you've got to register and then put your registration number on your craft either. That's just excessive bureaucracy. Just your phone number. Or at the very most, your name and your phone number. That's all you need. So Iceland, you lose a point for that. I'm sorry, but you can try harder there. Now, they have a really good policy in terms of weights. If you're flying in an urban environment, you can't fly anything heavier than three kilograms. B be honest, I would never fly anything that weighed as much as three kilograms in an urban environment. Uh, no. When I'm flying around people and property, with a chance, if something goes wrong, you could injure someone or you could damage property, I want to fly the lightest possible drone. So there's the least risk to personal property. And to that end, um, I do virtually any of the video jobs I've done. I did a wedding recently and I used a mini quad and it came out wonderfully because I was flying you know, 450 grams. And if it fell from the sky, the chance of someone getting hurt is much less than if it was a, an Inspire or something like that. You know, so yeah. Just tools, horses for courses. So, um, yeah, 3 kg, that's more than enough for an urban environment. If you're flying outside an urban environment, you can have 25 kilograms, which is kind of an internationally accepted standard, you know, 55 pounds in America and so forth. I think New Zealand, it's, it's somewhere around there, I don't know, because I don't have anything that big, so it doesn't concern me. But, uh, yeah, that's a fairly reasonable sort of a thing. That, that's okay. So, um, Iceland, you get another point for that. Now, we have also... Maximum altitude 400 feet above ground level, 120 metres. That's, again, the international standard. The USA, the UK, New Zealand, Australia, 120 metres, 400 feet above ground. That seems to be the accepted maximum for drones and model aircraft because manned aircraft shouldn't be below 500 feet unless they're you know, complying with certain conditions. So there should be this 100 feet of vertical separation. That's where your safety comes from. As long as you stay below 400 and the full size stays above 500, there should never, ever be an incident between a drone and a manned aircraft. So, excellent. No problems with 400 feet. Besides which, if you are flying a model at 400 feet, it gets a bit hard to see if it's small. And if you're flying a camera drone, then everybody looks like ants. So you might as well just go and film an ant farm from a lower altitude. It's really, it's quite simple. Uh, you must keep within line of sight. Now, this is always a contentious, a bit of a thorny issue, the line of sight thing, isn't it? Do you, is it important? Well, regulators say, oh, you've got to stay within line of sight because you don't have as much situational awareness when you're flying a drone as you do when you're flying a manned aircraft. I say, I cry bullshit to that, and I can prove it. I can prove that every time. But then again, the risk factor does increase dramatically if you cannot see your model or your drone because you don't know if there's an aircraft in the same vicinity. If you're 10 miles away, how the hell would you know what was around you? You can see through the FPV perhaps, but you can't see what's coming up behind you, and you can't spend all your time spinning around and around in circles to keep a proper eye out. But then again, neither can manned aircraft, can they? Hmm. Anyway, that's uh, by the by, but you've got to stay within line of sight. Fair enough. Every other country in the world, I think, requires that. So you can't penalise Iceland for that one. Now, if you're flying in an urban environment, you must stay at least 50 metres away from buildings, and probably from people too, I can't remember. I'll put a link to these rules in the description of this video. Go and have a look for yourself. Because it's all laid out, they've got a very nice laid out chart, very easy to follow, very good, excellent top works in terms of communications, Icelandic airspace regulator. You've done a very good job. You're, you're to be commended for that, unlike our local 
uh, airspace regulator here in New Zealand who needs a kick up the jacksy because they've done it all wrong. But there you go, 50 metres. If you're in a rural environment, 150 metres. Not such a big hurdle because there's more space in a rural environment. So you don't need to get close to things to enjoy the great outdoors. So I'm happy with that. That's fine and dandy. Um, you may not fly over crowds of people. Oh, of course not. What moron in their right mind would deliberately fly over crowds of people with a dry neural model aircraft? You don't do it. It's common sense. Like, things go wrong. Shite happens, and when it happens, you don't want to have people underneath your craft. If you lose an ESC or a motor, or something goes wrong, you want it to float gently to the ground and land in a pile of fairy dust. You don't want it to smack someone's head open and, or, or crack, break a windscreen on a car. No, 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 no. So these are common sense things, but it has to be said, common sense is often in short supply. So it doesn't hurt to have them written into the regulatory frame. Most of us wouldn't need that rule written down. Some people do, they need everything written down, itemised in fine detail. But there you go, so Iceland, you have done a pretty good job. Now commercial operations in Iceland, even better. You don't need to get some special certification, you don't need to sit a test or an exam, you don't need to, because in reality, it, getting, making money from a flight doesn't make it more risky than if you don't make money. I mean, this is the whole thing, this is the problem that regulators face. <clears throat> if I go out and I, go to my friend's farm and I film their farm with my drone and I get all this wonderful panoramic stuff and I, you know, and I do it because I like flying my drone. It's legal in just about every country. But if I do that and I charge them, if I go and video a farm and charge them $1,000 to do that because they're going to use it for marketing the farm or something or selling it, then I have to, in most countries I have to get special waivers and permissions and stuff like that. But hang on a minute, what if I took the first footage that I did just for sheer fun and enjoyment and then later on I sold that to the farmer for $1,000. Does my flight retrospectively become more risky? No, it doesn't. So risk and commercial operations are not inexorably linked. They're not necessarily linked. Most of the time they aren't. The risks are there whether you're flying for money or not. So I think it's just a money grab that most regulators say, oh, you've got to give us this money for this and do that. In Iceland, they're not stupid. New Zealand's the same. You don't have to be you know, have special registration to fly commercially here. Um, in Iceland, there's only a couple of extra conditions. First of all, you must mark your drone. What does that mean? Do you, um, I guess you don't have to put your name and address on it. You can get a big felt pen and go, crisscross, I've marked it, that's my drone. As long as it can be recognised that it's your drone, I suppose, is what they're saying there. And you must register your flight. So basically, file a flight pen, which again is not a silly idea because if you are doing a commercial flight, you may be more likely to be flying near buildings and people and things, or in airspace where there could be other aircraft. So in that case, you register your flight and the aviation regulator can let other people know that the risk level in that area may be a little bit higher because you're flying your drone. Good, common sense, no problems with that, nothing at all. Fantastic, that's fine. So there you go, it's all pretty simple. Drone rules in Iceland, I give them a solid 8 out of 10. Now I mentioned CAA a bit in that last little segment on Iceland and I'm going to mention them again because CAA have done some really good things with our regulations. We, we invented the shielded operation thing which lets you fly near airports and things common sense but it's, it's documented and it's laid out so people can understand it. It means that you know they realize that you don't find 747s and Cessnas flying amongst the trees in your local park so it's fine doesn't matter how close the park is to the airfield as long as you stay below the level of the trees you're not going to become a risk or a nuisance to other people. It's fine or certainly not other people in aircraft. But CAA in New Zealand I'm gonna have to give them some brickbats. Um, I, let me, I won't try and get too sort of in depth about this, but basically we have a problem with tourists coming to this country and not knowing what the rules are. And I mentioned in a previous vlog that some guy, some I think it was South American, a Chilean or someone, um, he got arrested for flying his drone near a firefighting operation. And he appeared in court a week or two ago and he was hand, they, the, basically the court confiscated his drone. He wasn't fined, he, he wasn't imprisoned um, because he was about to leave the country anyway. So they simply confiscated his drone and he was convicted of the, of the offence. So that's fine and dandy. Ignorance was the major component in that offence. He didn't know well enough what the rules were. Now we have a, a story in today's newspaper, and I'll put a link to it in the description of this vlog. Uh, the air tourist operators in various parts of New Zealand are becoming increasingly concerned at the risk that drones pose to their operations and the, and the safety in, of the people they carry. Now normally I get a bit oh, sceptical about these, you know, tourism operators and, and the manned aviation industry because they are fighting for their livelihood, not their lives. They see drones as a threat. You know, why would you come on our helicopter tour of this lovely lake when you can fly around it with your drone and get all the pictures you want anyway? I can see that where it's coming from. But, but I put my practical, my Mr. Pragmatic hat on here 
and a little bit of devil's advocate hat because they say, well, hang on a minute. Um, they've got a point in this case. We've got drone areas where there's a lot of helicopter operations, a lot of tourism operations, helicopters coming and going with people on board showing them the sights. And we've got other idiots flying drones there. Usually tourists from outside New Zealand arrive at the airport, you know, um, bust down to the motel and then go on the tour and they get their drone out and they're filming all the wonderful scenic sites. The same sites that people are flying around in helicopters to see. No, 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 bad news. And in fact, it's against the law. You can't do that. You cannot fly your drones near helicopters, right? But these people don't know what the rules are. And why don't they know what the rules are? Well, because nobody's told them. Nobody's told them. And whose job is it to tell them? CAA, I believe. Now, I've mentioned this in a previous vlog that I believe CAA should be giving out their little safety brochure, they've got a little orange safety brochure, giving it out at the airport to everyone who steps off a plane, or at least offering it to them. Do you know the drone rules? There you go. Or just including it in the little set of documentation you get when you arrive in New Zealand, you know. Um, then they'd have no excuse not to know what the rules are. Now, when I put this to CAA, CAA they said, well, it's too expensive. These, it cost a fortune. We've got millions of visitors every year, and we'd have to give them all this brochure. Oh, no, 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 too expensive. You know, human life's only worth so much. Uh, so I said to them then, well, then let's be, let's be thinking outside the box a little. Why don't you just get a big poster, a big banner put up at the entrance to New Zealand through the airports that says, drone rules, with a big QR code. And people can get the camera and go, click. And then they've got it in PDF on the camera, or they can go to the website. So simple. Five seconds, quick and easy. Then again, they've got no excuse not to know what the drone rules are. CAA said, yeah, that's a great idea. Fantastic. It was about a year ago, and they've still done nothing. And now we've got increased instances of tourism, tourists breaking the rules they don't know exist. Why hasn't CAA acted on the recommendations that I gave them? And, and many of you will have filled out the uh, survey form that CAA produced a little while ago. They did a survey and invited everyone to participate. And I recommended that my viewers go and participate in the survey. Let them know what they think. One of the biggest risk factors that was, that was identified by the people responding to that survey was the risk that tourists who don't know the rules. They've, everyone knows it. Everybody knows that tourists just don't have a clue what the rules are. Everyone's told CAA. I've even given them an ultra low cost way of informing them and they're not doing anything about it. And there's no point in making rules, no matter how draconian, if you're not going to inform the people that those rules apply to. CAA has failed on an epic scale in respect to this. And although I say that the risks of drones and helicopters is, is much less than is stated, I am the first one to admit that there is a risk. There is a risk. If a drone hits a helicopter, there is a risk that people will die. And it's an unacceptable risk, in so much as we could manage that risk, we could mitigate that risk to a huge extent by simply informing the people who are flying the drones that they're not supposed to do it. By putting up a $100 poster at the airport. $100. If everyone in CAA said, I'm not going to drink coffee for a week, I'm not going to have biscuits for a week, they could put a poster up in every one of New Zealand's international airports at no cost to taxpayers. They just forego the coffee. Just, you know, just put your coffee away, put the donuts down for a moment and think of safety. I challenge CAA to do that in New Zealand. I challenge you CAA to put a poster in every international airport with a QR code and a, a website and a PDF file people can download. Do it by the end of the week. You can do it. It takes as long or as short a time as you want it to. Prove to me and all the people watching this vlog that you're serious about safety and you're not just there to make rules, but you're there to actually keep things safe. Because at the moment, you're making rules, but you're not promulgating them to the people that need to know about them. And if you don't promulgate them like that, then you're not doing your job. And if people die, guess who's responsible? Yes, the drone operator that didn't know the rules, but also the people who could have informed them of those rules for a hundred bucks and chose not to. Think about it, CAA. I'm looking at you. Right, and the thing that everyone's been emailing me about is the drone dive of an airliner in Nevada. What do I think of that? Well, you have to ask. <laughs> Anyone that did that obviously was dropped on their head as a child because no sane person would do it. No one with their full mental faculties would do that. No one with their full mental faculties would even create a CGI representation, a, a fake video that showed that because you know that the, the, the fallout for the model flying in the drone community, it will be enormous. What were you thinking? You weren't thinking. This is terrible. Um, I would urge people who know this person to take him at the back of the bike sheds and kick the snot out of him because that's what he deserves, honestly. It is just a bad, bad, bad thing to do. No, absolutely not. Oh, it's a, what, 
lost for words. Doesn't happen much, doesn't happen often in this vlog, but I really am lost for words. And the other thing is I find that people have put this video up and monetized it. <laughs> people are making money out of this video, which I find kind of interesting because, let me go to the final thing on my list to talk about today, it's YouTube. YouTube, YouTube has become, oh, oh yes, we're very, we're very uh, aware of community standards and, and we want our channels you know, doing the right thing and not portraying bad behavior and things. Yet people have monetized this video. They're making money out of show, showing something that, which in, effectively, in theory, endangers the lives of other people. Because YouTube, I may get demonetized. My channel may get closed down because of this, but I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna call a spade a spade. I don't mince around. I'm too old to stroke egos and finesse people and to be diplomatic. I just tell it like it is, right? That's why you watch this vlog. There's no fluff. It's all fact. And to be honest, YouTube is out for the dollar. They're not out to preserve community standards. They're not out to make sure that people aren't exposed to unsavory material. They're out to make a dollar. And you can't blame them for that because that's what businesses do. The only reason, the only reason that YouTube has clamped down on some of these things is because advertisers have stopped advertising with them. If the advertisers are still advertising, YouTube wouldn't give a damn. They wouldn't care. But the advertisers have said, we don't want to be associated with unsavory material. So YouTube has said, bam, hit our bottom line, we'd better do something. And a good example is this guy, Logan Paul. Now, I'd never heard of Logan Paul because I'm not the sub 50, you know, people with less than 50 IQ points who watch him. And, but they're a great audience. YouTube advertisers love people who are really quite a, you know, a bit challenged. They must do because um, they're easy to sell to. Now, I watch an ad on YouTube if I have to, and I'll go, not interested, that's crap, you know, or I'm not going to buy that. I think people with, who watch the Logan Paul channel and PewDiePie and these other channels which cater to such a weird demographic are the kind of people who, if they see an ad on YouTube, oh, I must buy that. I have to buy it. It was on YouTube. And so advertisers probably get a really good return on the ads they stick on those channels. And YouTube, of course, charges them for those ads, so YouTube makes a lot of money. Now, Logan Paul, I read today, was making about a million dollars a month out of his YouTube channel. A million bucks a month! Seriously, I will never make anything close to that out of my YouTube channel if I live to 100 in, 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 in total. Um, and he earns that in a month. I mean, what? I mean, I must, I don't know, I'm not, it's, it's a 20th of that. Oh, it's less than that. It's a tiny, tiny fraction I earn from YouTube. But he earns this money because he has lots and lots of young lads who watch him because he does pranks. He does dumb stuff. He does the stuff that you and I did when we were seven or eight, you know, at school, you know, um, practical jokes and things. But he's 22. <laughs> and he got himself into trouble. He put a video up, showed um, dead body in a thing called the Suicide Park in J Japan. You probably know all this. I'm probably telling you stuff you already know, but was it... A bad thing to do well you know it's i don't know um, i really don't know i wouldn't my when i think about these things i sort of the test is would i do this myself and no i wouldn't do it would i do it if i could earn a million bucks a month i don't know i still don't think i'd do it because i'm not so money focused as some people i mean i my philosophy in life is if at the end of the month I've paid all my bills and have a dollar left over. I'm happy. You know, that's it. I'm not, I don't want to accumulate large amounts of wealth, which is probably quite good because it's quite fortunate because I have accumulated large amounts of wealth. I prefer to do things for the greater good. Now, you'll probably have seen that I've got some projects coming up with the uh, little sub-250 gram camera drone and the digital FPV system, and they're all going to be open source. I'm not going to say, oh, let's crowdfund it and let's make a lot of money for me. I'm going to say, let's make it open source. Let's educate people. Let's show them how stuff works. Let's let them put their own stuff together. And instead of making a snot load of money, let's just share the information, share the, the wealth of knowledge. That's the way I come anyway. So when I see people like Logan Paul exploiting these, really the... the sorrow of others like the family of the person who he filmed i mean how do they feel about that having seen the corpse of their loved one on on his youtube channel no not very good but youtube their response to this has been oh this is terrible let's demonetize all the small channels because this guy who earns a million dollars a month has done something wrong <laughs> oh, it's all about money isn't it never mind that's why i don't fit very well into this whole framework but that's it my sd card is almost full i can see the little flashy thing on the screen so i've ranted on far too long damn it but there you go that's another rant Comments, questions in the place provided by YouTube. Thumbs up if you like it, thumbs down if you don't. Tell your friends. Tell your friends because I'd like to keep this going. Spreading word, you know, spreading the word about the rules, regulations, the, the good things, the bad things in the hobby, and keeping you all informed. And the more people who watch the videos, then the more likely I am to keep on doing this because I could make a dollar from YouTube. <laughs> Not a million, just the one. There you go. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Stay tuned. More stuff coming on XJet and RC Model Reviews.